It's a big deal for a 16 year old to get on a boat going somewhere they've never been before with everything they own in a little box. Where businesses think their only job is to extract value and not contribute to communities. And that's why there's a war on capitalism right now. And there's a war on politics right now. And the two sides are blaming each other and fighting. And as we see in this pandemic, you need both. The ramifications of this are going to be far worse than people understand. For every million people that are out of work, somewhere between 800 and 900,000 will ever get their jobs back. I think, I think you're spot on, Jay. If you're in the airline business or the hospitality business, your revenue is going to be less and your costs are going to be more. And it's not going to be incremental change. It's going to be dramatic change. Way more changes than 9-11. Steve Jobs was a great mentor of mine. Jack Welch, Walter Scott, everybody should have a mentor. You don't want to wait for something to happen to you. You want to make something happen to everyone else. David McCourt, thank you for joining us on the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here, Jay. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I know you don't do many podcasts and uh, interviews. I was looking, doing some research, so it's a real honor for you to come onto our podcast. And uh, I put some posts out. It was uh, a few days ago and this morning, and it's gone crazy. I've got so many questions, but I'm going to have to try and be, you know, try and pick the best ones, but they're all good, but pick a select few because of time's the essence. So, you know, just to intro, David, just to yourself, you're an Irish American entrepreneur within telecoms and cable television, and um, you sold your phone company to Worldcom for $14 billion. And uh, we're going to talk about your story going backwards, but it's interesting because your book, I think a lot of us now have to rethink a lot of things. So, you know, that book now is probably more relevant and it's probably been forced upon us than, than it was when you wrote it. Well, yeah, there's been a lot, Jay. The book uh, is called Total Rethink and it's been, um, there's been a lot of demand for it lately because yeah. we're seeing right now in the middle of this COVID crisis that lots of things that we thought were working aren't working. So we need to rethink a lot of things, including um, our political system, including capitalism, including healthcare. There's a lot of things that need to be rethought. So yeah, total rethink was, it was timely when I wrote it, but I think it's even more timely now. Yeah, definitely. I thought that when I was doing the research and looking at the book, but definitely. But I want to go also, a lot of my viewers and listeners, you know, I, I want them to know a bit about your story. And it's fascinating, your backstory, because myself, you know, my, my, my granddad and my parents are from India. They migrated over to the UK. And when I was researching your story and studying what, what you went through, I kind of felt the similarities. And so I want to talk about your story about when your granddad came over, your grandparents came over from all the way from Ireland to the US. Take us back a bit, and because uh, I know you still got some items as well. Take us back a bit, David, on that story and that journey. Let the audience know what it's about. Well, you know, my grandparents came over. They were 16 and 17, respectively, and they came over separately. Uh, they met each other in Boston when they, when they got to America. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's a big deal for a 16-year-old to get on a boat going somewhere they've never been before with everything they own in a little box. You know, that box is, is, you know, smaller than what you or I probably take, take away with us if we're going away to the Cotswolds for the weekend. We probably take a bigger, a bigger bag with us. And that had everything they owned. And they made a life for themselves. My, my grandfather was a janitor, so he cleaned toilets for a living. And then, um, and then my dad was a contractor. And most of, you know, most of the Irish in those days were cops, firemen, or contractors, or janitors. And that was the, the life for an Irishman in Boston in those days, in South Boston. But uh, because of their efforts, I was able to start my own business. Because of the path they led for me, I was able to stand on their shoulders and start my business, which, as you said, I built the first competitive phone company in America, which was great. And I, and I also built the first competitive or uh, the first independent TV station in the island nation of Grenada, which was also uh, great fun in, in those days. And now, which is, I think, more important, what am I doing now? I'm, I'm building a, the, the largest public-private partnership in Europe around telecom. We're building a, a telecom network in Ireland to end the urban-rural divide. 
so that people in rural areas can have products and services at the same level that they have in urban areas so they can they can live and survive in a rural environment you know jay we're seeing in this in this covid <coughs> excuse me in this covid crisis how difficult it is when there's a problem like this in an urban area when people are so jammed together and globally and a lot of this is happening in, in the country where your grandparents are from but it's happening all over the world there is two manhattans a week the size of manhattan times two every week move into urban environments around the world so that gives you an idea you know three million people a week move into urban environments because rural life is is no longer sustainable but that has to be fixed it's bad for the environment it's it makes the housing expensive it's you know bad for the carbon footprint it's bad bad for congestion and it's bad for rural and urban life alike. So that's what I'm working on now anyway. Yeah, to talk to you on telecoms, I was going to come to that a bit later on, but there's a lot of talk about 5G at the moment. And um, I don't know if you, you know about 5G, you're involved with your setups around that. And there's one controversy, David Icke, he's done an interview recently. I mean, do you know much about 5G? Is it a risk or is that just something which is, Look, you I'm know? Not, I'm, I'm, um... I'm not an you know an engineer that specializes in in wireless uh, and cellular technology, so I would be the wrong one to ask. Um, but I think that I think one of the risks, which is not the health risk, but one of the other risks to it is um, the West sort of gave up on its development of 5G technology, so we're all dependent on one part of the world for it. And that's never healthy for competition. It's not healthy for national security. It's not healthy for a supply chain if one country gets shut down, like we see very possibly right now. So I, I think uh, the thing that I'm more focused on is not the health risk, not because I wouldn't be worried about them if there is one, I just don't know. But we were, we had great companies like Bell Labs and Lucent Technologies with great companies in, in the West that were developing all sorts of technologies. And it's good to have these technologies developed globally in the East and the West, in the South and in, in Africa too. I mean, these technologies should be developed all over the world. So the pricing is more competitive and um, the risks to supply chain and the risk to, to national security are less. That's more what I would be focused on. Yeah, no, great point, great point. I know I know went off track there because there's so much happening in the, in this world that you could just talk about anything. So going back to your story, going back a bit, I mean, one thing I think, you know, I, um, I'm i going to be doing a TED Talk. I want to talk the title was about the, uh, the migrant mindset, you know, the immigrant mindset. And um, one thing that, you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs need to go back to is probably some of that. Because when our grandparents or your grandparents came over, having nothing meant they can go to zero and start again. I think what's happening now is a lot of things that we've been used to are going to be taken away in some industries. Um, what, what do you think about that? Because you obviously you've been bought of that mindset and you've, been, you've watched how it evolved. What do you think about that? I think, I think you're spot on, Jay. Look, it, it, <clears throat> when you're coming up from the bottom and you have nothing, you're much more willing to take risks. So, um, you know, your, your podcast, I think it's called The Business Mentor, right? Yeah, so, that's right. So if, if any of your listeners are, are looking uh, for a mentor, hopefully the first thing that mentor teaches them is, you know, you got to be prepared for failure. And when you have nothing, is what you call the migrant mindset, you know what it's like. So you're prepared to go there again because you can still taste it. When you become... When you get farther and farther away from that and you can't taste it anymore, it, you become more afraid. You become more afraid to take chances. And that's a unhealthy place to be if you're trying to start a business. It's an unhealthy place to be if you're trying to change the world or if you're trying to change your business. It's, it's so I, I think you're right. You're spot on, which is why I'm a big fan of letting more um, immigrants into America. I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of Trump's current thinking on that. 
Well, we, we both wouldn't be in the countries we were if it was uh, it was a total non-immigrant, migrant kind of kind of country, which we were yeah, you, built on. I, I'd be, I, you and I both would be in different countries. Exactly right. Yeah. It, yeah. I'm going on the podcast. The reason I've caught the business mentor podcast is because in 2009, when the recession came, I was really struggling. And my mentor at the time is very successful. He helped me through that. And you mentioned about materialistic things. We did really well. I had an Aston Martin, really expensive car. And that's when I felt it most because I had to give that up. And then I realized that I need to go to zero. And this podcast was for people that maybe get in a situation like that, they've got the knowledge from you, from everyone that I interview to help them through that. So that's why we're doing it at the moment. Look, everybody should have a mentor. Uh, uh, Jack Welch, who was the CEO of GE, who recently died, was a great mentor of mine. Uh, Steve Jobs um, from Apple, another guy that's passed away, unfortunately. Yeah. Walter Scott, who's on the Berkshire Hathaway, he's on Warren Buffett's board. Uh, I talked to him this morning, another mentor of mine. A everyone should have a mentor. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important that, you know, as business people, that the podcast and stuff, people can reach them even if they can't sit down and talk to someone like you face to face. It's important to have that information. But going on to, to business and, um, you know, going on to be an entrepreneur, obviously it's been quoted and uh, of, of, of your wealth and being a billionaire and when you've sold that company. But do you think anybody could be a billionaire or do you think that's something which, you know, if you could answer that question, do you think anyone can be a billionaire? Well, for, for, first of all, I'm, uh, you, you know, I'm not sure I would, I would believe everything, you know, everything that, that you read, but um, no, and I think, but I'm not sure that's the right question. I think, should, it, should people care? I mean, what you should do with your life, because it's a limited amount of time on this planet, is, is something you love with people you love for a reason you love. So doing something that you really care about with people that you care about in something that's going to make money, but also contribute to society. So that's one of the big problems. And I write about this in my book yeah. is that business used to always be about making money and adding value to the communities that you do business in. Over the last 50 years, capitalism has changed it to a way that's uh, to a form that's unrecognizable really to me where businesses think their only job is to extract value uh, and not contribute to communities. And that's why there's a war around capitalism right now, Jay. That's why your young viewers are going to have a much, much harder time than I did because there's a war on capitalism right now as there probably should be. And there's a war on politics right now, as there probably should be. And the two sides are blaming each other and fighting. And, and the, the political body blames big business. Big business blames the political body. And as we see in this pandemic, uh, pandemic you need both sides. Yeah. You need government to function and you need big business to function. And I, I don't see either of them functioning at, at the highest level right now. Yeah, you talk about collaboration, one of the biggest things in, you know, total rethink. And, and going on, you know, because you mentioned about Trump, you know, Trump getting elected was a lot to do with people seeing their wage packets going less from like, I think it's 85 to 65. So how does this play out now? Because obviously the economy is taking a big hit at the moment. Um, you know, how does this play out now? Because... Who do, who do people vote for now? Like you said, it's a massive war. Is, is there a way out of this? Whereas, who do people trust? Because on one side, you've got the Trump, you've got the wealth now getting taken more and more away, eroded even, even faster. How does it play out, David? Well, Jay, the, the ramifications of this are going to be far worse than people understand. For every million people that are out of work globally, somewhere between 800 and 900,000 will ever get their jobs back. It's just not going back to the way it was before. If you take a company as an example, when, when a company gets into trouble and um, a restructuring investor comes in and buys that company, the first thing they do is they, they lay off or make redundant a whole bunch of people. And the old owners that got in trouble have trouble doing that. The new owners that have no emotional attachment have no trouble doing that. And that company operates just fine with less employees. So if you take the whole globe right now, and you look at it, it's going through a restructuring, they, these, the same amount of employees will never be used to do the same job again. Never. 
And I don't know whether that number is 90% or 80% or 70%, but all these jobs are not coming back. And that's a big problem because at the same time that that's happening and at the same time we're trying to rebuild the economy, we have to rethink the economy because we need to put those people to work. Yeah. And big businesses have to stop only extracting value and government has to stop trying to uh, uh, live every day for the sole job of just getting reelected. They have to start serving the people that put them in that job to begin with. So look, I benefited from the system up close. I, I benefited from you know, the capitalist system, but it's, it's unrecognizable now from the system that I grew up with and it needs to change. So, the out, so to answer your question specifically, Jay, on the other side of this, it won't be business as usual. If you are in the airline business or the hospitality business, uh, your revenue is going to be less and your costs are going to be more. Now that's a bad dynamic. Yeah, as, definitely. As one example, but there's a hundred examples like that. So what your listeners should do is, is put themselves in the future and look back and say, what does the world look like a year from now? That's the world I need to design my business around not the present world. And it's not going to be incremental change. It's going to be dramatic change. Way more changes than 9-11. Way more changes. So if you were small, like a lot of my audience are like small, medium-sized businesses. I mean, for that's them... Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And that's what really drives the economy. But if someone's listening to this now and they've got a small business and they relied upon the business, are you kind of saying... You know, rather than waiting for this to kind of like, you know, the people say everything's going to go back to normal, but we know there's, there's, there's research on this. Obviously now we're looking, it might not, well, it probably won't go back to normal. So what would you advise them to do? Because they are the ones that are sitting at home in lockdown thinking that once these doors are open, they're going to go back to normal. Well, they might, they, depending on what business they're in, may go back to normal. If, if they're in the um, healthcare sector, they may go back to normal. If, if, they're in, um, <clears throat> if they're in primary, you know, um, what we call in America high school education, that might go back to sort of normal. But if they're in higher education, if they're in university level, if you're not the top sort of 20% of the universities, that's not going back to normal. No one is going to, is going to uh, take courses from home and realize that that works efficiently and then go back to spending $50,000 a year yeah. for an education in a classroom. They're gonna say, look, you, you gotta offer something else. If I could do it at home, virtually for free, you gotta offer me something else if you're gonna be charging that much money. Now the top, top universities will be fine. Harvard will be fine. Georgetown, Penn, Duke, Oxford, Cambridge. You know, the top universities in the world will, will, will be fine. But if you are at the bottom, that's, that's never going back to normal. If you're, like I said, in the hospitality industry, that's never go back for normal. So what should these small, small businesses do? They should A, <clears throat> excuse me, watch their cash, um, work harder than they've ever worked in their life, stay focused, and put themselves in the future. They've got to put themselves in the future, Jay, and say, what's the future gonna look like, and how does my business fit in? You, you, can, you, you knew, after 9-11, what the future would look like. You knew there was going to be more security. You knew you weren't going to walk into a high-rise building without going to a security guy in the lobby. You knew airline lo lo uh, lines were going to be longer. You knew there was going to be more security to get on public transportation. You, know, you, can, you knew there was going to be barriers around public buildings and so forth. You knew there was going to be more cameras, more surveillance. So you could figure that out. And how does your business fit into that? You could figure it out if you put yourself in the future. Now you have to put yourself in the future again. Uh, you know, co-working spaces. If you're in the co-working space, that's going to have to be rethought. If you're in the if you're in the the business of serving up buffet lunches, where it's where it's out to everyone to look at and breathe on, you better be rethinking that real quick. So you have to you know what business you're in. Your listeners know what business they're in. They need to put themselves in the future, look at that environment, and adjust their business plan while watching their cash staying focused and probably working twice as hard as they're working now. If they don't think that's possible, well, they're gonna have to dig deep. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned about the cash because I've interviewed um, a billionaire recently and, and, and very well an entrepreneur. And I think a lot of the questions that I get asked is, oh, ask him if, ask yourself if cash is trash. Now, I, w I think the question that we would should be asking is uh, where you are in your business journey, how vital is cash? Now, if you need cash to survive and pivot, then you it's so important to have the cash now. But obviously, if you've got lots of wealth, then obviously there's other areas you can make cash. So how would you respond to that, David? Because a lot of people get confused with that, with people saying, oh, you know, you shouldn't have cash. I always say you should always have, you know, that maybe the migrant mentality is always have cash backed up for situations like this. And I always tell my people I work with to have that cash because it's so important. Look, it's the only thing that doesn't lie. Cash is the only thing that doesn't lie. It, 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 it's, it's king. Always was, always will be. So having liquidity and having access to capital um, is, is totally critical in times when everything's being repriced. Every asset on the planet, Jay, has been repriced over this last month. And that repricing is gonna continue next month, the month after, and the month after, and the month after. So that repricing, don't get fooled by the stock, the stock market yeah. bouncing back. All assets have been repriced. Real estate, uh, um, businesses. Look, I, I talked to a friend the other day. He had 1,200 stores, um, most in Europe, and uh, was, you know, was making 13 million sterling a week. Wow. Now he's laid off 9,000 people and closed every store. His business is never going to be the same. Yeah. Never going to be the same. So, yeah, in a sense, I think, like you said, cash is king in a sense, because if you've got cash, you can pivot. I always say cash is the oxygen of your business. And when people say that, you know, you need that, especially when you're building a small business up. So important. 100%, Jay. Cash is, it's the only thing that doesn't lie, Jay. It's, it's critical. Yeah, yeah. Liquidity is critical in tough times. So, you know, so in a sense, because the thing is, David, you know, there's a lot, I mean, Oh, the amount of small businesses are out there at the moment. And I feel like a lot of businesses have been left out. But I suppose you could say, you know, innovations, you should always innovate in your businesses. And I think it's going to be a tough time now. And like you said, the key things I've always said, the last month I've been working so hard interviewing, trying to get more information out to people. But I think now is the time just to relook at everything, evaluate everything and then pivot where you need to. Because you can't wait for something to happen because it may never happen, like you said. Well, if you wait, if you wait for something to happen, then you have, to, then you're on defense. Yeah. You want to be on as a business person. Most of your listeners are business people. You don't want to wait for something to happen to you. You yeah. want to make something happen to everyone else. Yeah. If you wait for something to happen to you, you're already behind. Yeah, that's true. And I always say, I'm encouraging people to do that. And what about, you know, the American dream and the, the UK dream of coming in, starting your business? Do you think by seeing this, a lot of entrepreneurs will, will get put off? Or do you think, as I spoke to one person I interviewed recently, who's very successful in the US, that entrepreneurship isn't for everyone? Um, do you think people are going to be put off going forward? Or do you think this will, you know, it's a difficult time at the moment for business people to handle this? Well, look, America, uh, and, and I know more about, I think, American, because um, that's where I grew up, than I would in, in the UK, which is where I live most of the year now. Um, America is a country of hopes and dreams. It always has been, and hopefully always will be, but it's much, much harder now than it was for me because uh, it, it, you know, there's a war against capitalism right now. So it's, it's, it's harder. Um, taxes are going to have to go up because of this huge rescue package. Healthcare um, costs are going up, but the quality of service is going down. Cost of education is going up, but the quality is going down. So, you know, uh, United States has some fundamental issues that they have to deal with. And yeah. if they don't deal with them, it's going to be a, a very rough ride ahead. Now, hopefully, you know, I, yeah, I wish Trump would read my book, you know, <laughs> uh, because, you know, he, he builds himself uh, as an entrepreneur. That's the last thing he is. You know, entrepreneurs need to be able to communicate clearly. They need to be consistent. They need to be passionate. They need to be empathetic. 
and they need to make the issues of the people they're leading the same as their issues. They need to make the issues, the leader and those being led, those issues have to be the same and their values have to be the same. So that's, you know, my book is about not being an entrepreneur. It's about thinking more entrepreneurially. So whether you're a nurse, a doctor, a teacher, a fireman or a firewoman, you want to think in a more entrepreneurial way because the world is moving so fast. Jay, for, for, for hundred, from the Industrial Revolution up to about 1990, the whole world worked on incremental change. It, it, everything was about little incremental changes. Now, because of the internet, because of social media, because of globalization, everything has to be rethought because everything's moving way too fast for incremental change. And that's what the book's about. It doesn't matter whether you're trying to rethink your life, your marriage, where you live, how you live, or your business. You know, my, my book is just to say and try to give people ideas of how to think in a more revolutionary, entrepreneurial way. But David, you mentioned that and it sounds the right thing to do. But if you watch the news, and I don't watch much of it, just to recap, you just, you ain't seeing signs of any big businesses or politicians moving in that direction. So I think, like you said, it may be a lot longer till we actually get to the point where people are really rethinking. I don't know what, I don't know what it will actually take for that to happen. Well, it'll take, you know, something that looks like a, a peaceful, quiet revolution because you can't keep on fighting and blaming each other. You can't keep on fighting for an extended period of time before the bottom rises up and said, look, I've had enough. The bottom is working just fine. The bottom, that migrant mindset that you talked about, they're keeping America working right now. They're stocking the shelves in the supermarket. They're cleaning the floors in the hospital. They're keeping people's houses on Park Avenue disinfected. That migrant, those, those, that migrant mindset that you talked about, they're keeping America going right now. So the bottom is doing fine. It's the top that's all messed up. Yeah, and, and the middle are getting hit even harder and because the they're in the middle. Squeezed. And the middle is yeah. getting squeezed. And it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. But, you know, even, I know we're talking a bit like on the negative side, but the positive thing from this could be amazing. If we can reignite people's hunger and energy and they're getting what they're worth, imagine a world like that will be absolutely amazing. You well, know? The, the amount of innovation that will come out of this will be amazing. If you want to talk about the positives, yeah. I, I think the positives are the amount of I innovation that will come out of this, the amount of money and effort that goes towards understanding the human body and the DNA and how it reacts, which is, which is way overdue. That, that sort of that money had been, had been sidetracked to other things. A rethinking of an efficient healthcare system at a reasonable cost. Um, the, the ability to educate people remotely. So yeah. I've had, a I had a doctor's appointment um, and my son had a doctor's appointment this morning both were done through video conferencing. And because these doctors now that were, were um, slow to take that up uh, for all the wrong reasons, mostly because you, know, you go to a doctor in America and you walk out, they take a, like a, um, a little sheet and they tick off like 15, that you go in to see and they tick off like 15 different things that they supposedly did because each one of them is an insurance code you know, yeah. to build more money. It's much, much harder to do that over video conference, which is, which you're gonna see claims to the insurance companies go down because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's much less, it's much more difficult to do that. So these doctors wanted to get you in their office, some of them, not all of them, but, but some of them were, were um, uh, slow on the uptake for their own personal gain. But how are you gonna roll out healthcare across seven billion people if you can't do a big piece of it the way you and I are talking now? How are you gonna roll out education across seven billion people if you can't do it the way you and I are talking now? The answer yeah. is you can't. So that there'll be more telemedicine, there'll be more distance learning, there'll be more innovation. And those are the businesses that your listeners should think about. Those are the businesses where there's huge opportunity. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because in the UK, you know, we're a struggling health system, but uh, the A&E 
waiting room is clear now because no one's coming because they're scared of the infection of catching it. So, it, it, you know, people can probably manage a lot easier. And if it's not that bad, they're, they're not going in now because they're scared of the infection. So it does, uh, it does open things up, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Cool. Dave, I want to go to some questions. I want to have a final uh, catch up and, and, and end of the podcast. You've already given so much value. I think that one step you gave about rethinking your business from, from yourself is really valuable. But, but my, my thing is the, the people I serve and help and build their businesses. So if I ask these questions, you can go um, deep if you want, or you can just like, you know, keep them short. That's fine. So Rob Sales, um, he's put a question. He goes, we, we've covered a bit of this. So bear in mind, it might be repeat. What do you think the post Corona world will look like general society education and business i know you've touched on it but is there anything you want to add to what you've already mentioned in the podcast well it, it, it'll be very different and and you know what he what he should do if he has a business himself is again put himself in the future imagine what that looks like turn around and then build a plan to get there it's very difficult jay to go from where you are in the present to the future the vision you create at the beginning is going to be nothing like the business you at the end and yeah. change right john woolley said if you were stripped of all your assets and cash what would you do to start again today that's a great question john that's a great question um and just so you know that's happened to me a couple times over my career you know you you, you make a bet it doesn't work right and and you're stuck look um if i if i was uh stripped of of everything obviously then you have to go to what your strong suit is. And media and telecom is my, my strong suit. So I would have to go, if I was down to nothing, I would have to go work in a media or a telecom company. And while I was, I'd put my eight or 10 hours in during the day. And then I put eight or 10 hours in at night, starting my own business. And I'd, you know, I'd have to go work. I'd have to work 16 to 20 hours a day, eight for the man, a woman that's hiring me in eight or 10 for myself and another 12 or 15 on Saturday and another 12 or 15 on, on Sunday until I got a business started up again. So just put in the work. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's a, that's a great response. Um, Anders has put uh, daily habits and structure for a, I was gonna say billionaire, but for yourself, what is the, your daily habits and structure? Well, because I'm in Los Angeles now, you know, I was up at 4 a.m. because I do a lot of business in Europe, so I have an eight-hour time difference. But um, I'm up. I'm up early anyway, whether wherever I am. Um, you, you know, not always at four, but by 5:30 anyway. And uh, in the gym, get get your workout, get your workout in, no matter what. Um, and um, I am a, a a a not as structured as I should be. But like, like everybody, you know, have my notebook, write my to-do list down and cross them off as I, as I go. Make sure that your weekly and monthly reports that you're supposed to be getting, make sure you read them. Make sure you focus on them. Make sure that, the, you know, every business has a little spreadsheet and there's little boxes of things that are supposed to happen. And you have to look at those and, and make sure they, they actually happen. I'm very healthy about what I eat. I'm very I'm religious about... Uh, you know, exercise and working out. I probably work longer than I should, which affects, you know, other people in my life that, that might, want, might, want, might want my time. Um, so I probably work a little longer than, than, than I should, Jay, but yeah, it is what it is. So 4 a.m. in the morning, it starts, and then you just work until, um, until obviously you finish, which, uh, you yeah. yeah. I'm the same. I'll just keep on going until oh, you think, why am I doing it? But yeah, you keep on going. So we've got Vir uh, Virgil and um, he's put a lot of these questions. I'll just, um, they may be repeated, but just, if we can just try and get the context of the question. But he said, what advice would you give yourself if you were 18 years old now um, and through your journey, what advice would you give yourself? Uh, to... Um Waste, uh, waste less time, um, be more focused, uh, spend, um, you know, organize your time. That, that's the thing that separates. It's not what you do. It's not what, it, 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 it's, it's how often you're disciplined to say no that really separates successful people from very successful people. 
how often you look at something and you just say no. You know, I'm not a big TV watcher, so that, that's not one of my one of my my habits. But some people, you know, can you say no to a to a TV show and, and do some reading and thinking? Uh, that extra beer that that maybe not only is taking up an extra half hour in the pub, but it's also going to slow you down the next morning. So it's your ability to say no that I think really really separates the the winners from the losers. So if I if I if I was talking to my 18 year old self, I'd say be a little bit more disciplined. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm pretty disciplined, but there's always room for more discipline. Be a little bit more disciplined. Say no more often. Yeah, great, great. So uh, Stuart asked for 50 quid, and I said that wasn't enough, so we've, we've left him out. <laughs> Jacqueline Stewart said, oh, yeah, this is a good question. This is from um, Akib, and he said, what are the three most important skill sets that you've got? And also, if you had to choose one of those, which one would you choose? I think the um, the most important is probably perseverance, um, and uh, another one would probably be an ability to really listen to what someone means, not what they say, but what they mean. Because people don't, everybody's brain works a little different, and they think they're articulating their position, but but you have to really peel away the onion to say, why are they saying it that way? What's their body language? What's their history? What's their experiences? Where are they sitting in this equation? And therefore, and you have to do all that in real time. You have to do those calculations in real time while someone's speaking. And you have to say, what do they really mean by that? Um, and I think I've developed a good ability to really understand what someone means by what they're saying. But if I had one, I would say uh, perseverance. I would say if I had to, if I had, if I could only leave, go on to my next life with one, it would probably be that perseverance. And did you? How, how do you get that skill set? Is that something you just do over time, or is it so? Because that's such a good skill, especially in this day and age. Is that something you? How, how do you harness that? Well, you know, I, I happen to be. I just ordered two two books from a guy named Ian Robertson about the way the brain the brain works, and, and I'm I'm reading them now, and it's 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 actually very interesting to to study what what you're born with and what you're not born with. But in that particular skill set, you can learn that you can you can learn to be dogged and not give up. Um, you know, that's a, that's a learned behavior. Some people just are um, tougher than others and some people wilt under, under pressure and, the, and you can train yourself to be tougher. You can absolutely train yourself to be tough. Now, it's also, Jay, a bad quality because there are times I'll do a bad deal and I'll insist on believing that I could fix it. And a year later, I'll say, I wish I had all those hours in that capital back. I should have, you know, thrown the towel in and moved on to something else, but I didn't because I wanted to prove to myself that I could solve that problem. And sometimes that persistence and that perseverance comes back to haunt you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, 100%, 100%. And how, how are you finding lockdown for yourself at the moment? How are you managing the lockdown yourself? I know you've mentioned you're doing a few, few things remotely. Well, you know, I'm still, I'm still getting my exercise in. I'm still working and, and you've, you've, you just adapt. I'm probably doing, um, you know, strangely enough, I'm probably reaching out to more people in a more efficient way than I was before. You know, sometimes you, you have someone on your list and say, oh, I want to I wanna talk to so-and-so and you never, I'm going to have coffee with Jay. I'm going to have lunch with Jay, but you never really get around to it and, and a month turns into six months, turns into a year. Now you can just call up Jay and say, hey, let's have a Zoom link. Let's, let's, yeah. let's have a chat. I don't have to worry about what restaurant, what pub I'm going to meet you at. I don't have to worry about fitting it in and getting there and going down to Sloan Square and getting on the tube and meeting you somewhere and then, you know, getting back. I don't have to do any of that. I just... Zoom link. So I'm actually seeing more people probably in having virtual coffees um, with more people than I would normally. Yeah, 100% agree with that. And even ourselves, the amount of stuff I've done over Zoom is phenomenal. I don't think I used Zoom before this as much. Yeah, uh, Zoom went, I just, sorry, I, I just read it yesterday. 
think they went pre-coronavirus, 10 million users, today, 200 million users. Wow. They're the kind of companies, I think you mentioned earlier on about looking at what's happening and, the, and you can, if, if you could look at, you know Zoom was going to do well, you know, when this kicked off and look at it now, look at the phenomenal yeah, reach. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if 200 million users means they're doing well because their, their business model is not clear to me of how they're going to make a lot of money, but that's near the end of that. Yeah, but what, uh, yeah, I suppose if they get the attention, then I'm sure they'll find a way to try and uh, monetize it because at the moment we need it. It's really important in the yeah, business absolutely. model. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really good. Thanks for those questions. So I'm going to go on a recap and then we'll just uh, finish off. And I want to know about your book and where people can find you. So, and the, you know, and the guy that wants the 50, the 50 a quid, I'd be glad to send it to him if he can send me yeah. a great product or service that I can offer rural communities to help reinvigorate rural communities. It's really important to me to figure out how to end this urban rural divide. So yeah. if he or any of your other listeners have great ideas and they reach out to me on social media, I'd be glad to give them 50 bucks. That's if awesome. They have, if they have a good idea and, and I'll give them a thousand if they have a fabulous idea that I can figure out how to give products and services to people in the rural parts of the UK, Ireland, US. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a really important issue for me. And we've all got a lot of time to think now, so I'm sure we can come up with some really good ideas to, okay. to send over. That would be awesome. So, you know, final tips. So if you could leave this interview, and you've given so much, David, and what, what would you, for, for small businesses, medium-sized businesses, if you could recap the interview, what are the highlights you would like to leave them with so they've got, they can go away and start doing things straight away? Do something you love with people you love. Uh, don't, don't do something just for money. Do something because you actually believe you're contributing to society and the money will come. Don't be an extra a contributor of value and money will come. Put yourself in the future and look back and design a plan for your life. Think more revolutionary uh, and, and, and think more entrepreneurially, even, and as I, I talk about this in my book, Total Rethink, even if it's about your marriage or your relationship or your life or where you work, it, you don't have to be an entrepreneur to think that way. And that's, uh, and be persistent and say no more often. Oh, great stuff. I look, I want to thank you for coming on. I really appreciate your time. Um, you know, this is about mentors and people having the information so they could help themselves. And what a great time now to, to research how people have done it and listen to the right advice. It's really important to do that. Um, your book is on Amazon. It is Total Rethink. And I'm on social media at DC McCourt on LinkedIn and uh, uh, Instagram. And I guess Instagram probably number one at DC McCourt. Also Twitter, also LinkedIn. But I'm, you know, I'm on all of them except for Facebook. But I'm on the other three anyway. So you can reach out, you know, if you've got any questions, obviously, if you've got any questions, you can reach me. But uh, if you want any uh, questions, direct, I'll forward them on. And David, we will meet. We will have that coffee. We'll have that meal once this is all over. It may be different. We may be doing it over some kind of different kind of area. But, you know, businesses will evolve. Entrepreneurs will evolve and we will all evolve. Always forward, never backwards, Jay. 100%. Keep moving forward. That's, that's the motto. That's all we can do. And like our grandfathers have done, you know, if they weren't kept moving forward, we'd be where we are today. So it's really important. Our grandfathers and grandmothers can come over here at 16 with one little bag. Then the least we can do is navigate through this. Yeah. And uh, it's very inspiring to, to, to look at their stories. We can do what we can do, but I want to thank you for your time. I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. I look forward to having that beer with you when, when the, the deal is lifted. 100%. Thank you for your time. So thank you for watching that video. If you want to see other videos and great guests, make sure you subscribe and like the video. So you can now head over to my website where you can see a bit of my story of building and scaling my businesses and also all the free resources and tools which you can help you on your journey in your brand and your business. You can also subscribe on the podcast so you can check on iTunes, Spotify and other locations where you can find the podcast. And I look forward to catching you very soon. Thank you.